Well, how many of you have a uh, Facebook page? Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, several of you do. Um, Facebook certainly is a wonderful social networking device that enables you to stay connected to your friends. Uh, I did some demographic work on our church Facebook page and uh, noticed that uh, we have a number of fans on our Facebook page. We have 10 different countries, as a matter of fact, that look at our Facebook page. Countries like Liberia and Kenya, Japan and others. There are over 10 countries where we have at least one fan that looks at our Facebook page. Um, we also have a number of languages. There are seven unique languages or language groups that use our Facebook page or at least check it out on a regular basis. Um, Facebook is really a great tool that enables us to stay connected to the people around us. I imagine it would be an interesting study if we took everybody's Facebook page here, counted up the friends, and see how many of you have friends and then how many friends are on those Facebook pages. I know I've got over 800 friends. 800 friends and counting because it seems like I just continue to uh, get more and more friend requests. Certainly I don't uh, confirm all of those requests and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but I have a number of Facebook friends on my page too. I wanna talk a little bit today about Paul's Facebook friends. Paul's Facebook friends. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 16. Paul's Facebook friends. We probably could reword that and say Paul's faith book friends. Paul's faith book friends. Because wherever Paul went, Paul met a network of people. And here, as we conclude our series in the book of Romans, um, we are given a list of Paul's Facebook friends. Those friends that the Apostle Paul made all along the way during his missionary journeys and how he kept in touch with them. Before we do that, though, I just want to review really quickly where we have been in the book of Romans. We have been looking at this series called It's All Good. We've been talking about the good news of the gospel. We've been talking about this message that God has given us and the message that has struck many of our hearts. We started in chapter 1, you remember. And in chapter 1, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Paul had a good news message. And the gospel is good news. It is great news. Paul then goes on in the latter part of chapter 1. And he moves into chapter 2 and he says this. Look. The good news is good news, but let me talk a little bit about the bad news. Remember? And he says the bad news is, is that, um, you know, all are falling. All have sinned. Paul says there that, um, that God has made it clear through creation and th clear through Christ that he is a part of the world. And he says that all creation every day shouts. And even people who don't know Jesus have a conscience that reminds them that something else is at work in the world, not just a closed universe. And then he moves into chapter 3. And he says what? He says the wages of sin is death, right? He says that the wages of sin is death. And that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he moves in chapter 4. And he says, look, what's the dilemma and how do we get out of that dilemma? And he goes right into Abraham and he says, look, he says, Abraham is your example. In fact, he goes back to the Old Testament and says, it is all by faith. The man who doesn't work but trusts in God receives this good news into his own life. And when that happens in chapter 5, he begins by saying we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, since you've been justified by faith, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ has replaced the Adam that got all this started. And he's the new Adam, the second Adam. And he goes on in chapter 6 to describe that as well. And he mentions the fact that eternal life is that free gift. And even though we receive that gift, there's in chapter 7 this constant battle that works over and over in us. Paul says that 
the good things I want to do in me or do I don't do and the things I don't want to do I do. He says there's always this battle between living in grace, going back to the law, trying to earn salvation on my own. There's always this battle. And there's always this battle in our interior person to do good. And sometimes we struggle with that. And salvation is not just a one-time process. It, it, yes, it's a decision, but it continues to work its way out in our lives. And he says, I'm really torn about this because he said, even though I believe this, I struggle in my own man. But then we have that wonderful verse in, in chapter 8, right? There is therefore now what? No condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And he finishes up that chapter with that sweeping look that I, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other thing in all the universe can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And he finishes that chapter with that resounding, beautiful victory song. And then he goes into chapters 9 through 11 and talks about the Jews and says, I don't get it though. This great victory that everybody can have, that the Gentiles seem to be uh, believing, it's, it's something that the Jews just aren't responding to. And it breaks his heart. Breaks his heart. And in Romans 10, he says, I just wish that everyone would do the very simple thing, and that is what? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And Paul wants that for everybody, but it seems like Israel particularly has a difficult time doing that. In fact, not only do they have a difficult time, but they go back and they try again to earn salvation through the law, and it doesn't work. It doesn't. You cannot add good works to the gospel because the gospel is by faith, by faith alone. And then he finishes up chapter 11 and says, oh, there's going to come a day, though, when there's going to be a group. There's going to be a group from Israel. There's going to be this group of people. We don't know what that necessarily all looks like, but it's going to happen. God's going to come back, and he's going to, to really minister and bless the people of Israel. But he moves from this deep look into the gospel in chapters 1 through 11 into now daily living the good life, and we've seen that, haven't we, in Romans chapter 12. And he starts out with, we've got to have our minds renewed and we have to give our lives as, as living sacrifices. And then he goes on for the remainder of Romans and says, what does that really look like? And in 13, it looks like this. You have to obey the authorities. God's established them. And then in chapter 13, he says, look, you have to love your neighbor. In fact, that's what the whole message of the good news is. It's love from start to finish. Because why? As Paul says in Romans 13, Love is the fulfillment of the law. And that love looks like this. It means that we look at other people and we consider their needs more important than our own. We think about them and try to understand them. And, and we, we put aside our own rights and we say, look, how can I bless and be a real cheerleader for others? Others. How can I have an other-centered kind of life? And the Apostle Paul says, look, it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's living this life of joy and love. And then in chapter 15, he says, here's some more ways you can be another sinner life. And now he finishes it up. He says, I want, I want to be sure that people understand that this message that I've listed from chapter 1 all the way through 15, it's gotten down to a lot of people. And it's ministered to a lot of people. And I want to give you my Facebook friends. And I want to give you my Facebook friends. I want you to take a look at them and I want you to, to see what you can learn from these people. Now certainly from a historical standpoint, the people listed in Romans chapter 16 are there as historical markers to help us kind of understand that the gospel and what Paul has written has gone to real people in real time in real space. And so Paul writes these, but he also writes these things because there's things for us to learn by the Holy Spirit as we look and move on down this list of Paul's Facebook friends. And so let's look at a few of these things that we can learn. So if you have your Bibles, turn, turn to Romans chapter 16. We're going to just briefly look on down here 
at Paul's Facebook friends, or perhaps we might say Paul's faith book friends, the people that he was familiar with as a result of them coming to the faith in Jesus Christ. And there are five things quickly that I want us to look at from this particular list of Paul's faith book friends. First thing is, and what we learn from Paul is, is to stay connected. Be interested in your friends and stay in touch with them. Be interested in your friends and stay in touch with them. That's what Facebook has done. It's provided a great network for all of us to stay in touch with friends we may have been disconnected with years ago. And Paul did that. Paul stayed in touch with them. Listen to one commentator talking about Paul's interest in the people that he ministered to. The Romans had built a tremendous system of roads between the various major cities of its vast empire, so movement by people from place to place was not unusual. As Paul preached in the eastern part of the empire, he first went to key cities, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Syria, Philippi, Corinth, Athens, Ephesians, and along the way, he met many believers who eventually ended up in Rome. The fact that Paul knew the whereabouts of so many of his friends and co-workers gives us a glimpse into this interest of the great missionary in people to whom he had blessed and ministered to. I mean, Paul was a people person. As great a theologian as he was, as great an apostle as he was, it was people that always touched Paul's heart. It was people that he stayed in touch with. He used the Roman road to do that. He used this network of Roman roads throughout the empire to stay in touch. We've got so many other networks that we can use to stay in touch and interested in our friends. In fact, Proverbs says this. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 10 says, Do not abandon a friend or a friend of your father. Better a friend nearby than a brother far away. Proverbs says, yeah, listen, it's better to have friends and to stay connected with friends. Friends that you make out there, but you know, friends that you have here in the church. And the church becomes a great, great network of support in the gospel. And Paul seems to have had that same kind of network as well. Paul stayed in touch, and it's a good challenge for us. Hey, are there friends that maybe I haven't contacted that the Lord has put on my mind? Recently, I had dinner with an 88-year-old man because for the last two or three weeks, his name kept coming to my mind over and over and over. And I finally called him, and he was available to me. And we met, and I just touched base, and I wanted to thank him for his input in my life. Is there anybody like that that maybe you need to contact and say, hey, thanks for your input in my life. Thanks for the way that you, God, used the gospel in, in your life to touch my life as well. Paul did that. Paul did that right here. Let's look at a second thing, though. The good news <clears throat> transforms all kinds of people. The good news transforms all kinds of people into friends. <clears throat> it's amazing the people listed in this section in Romans chapter 16. You see many different people. You see males, females, you see people in different places of work. You see people in other places. All kinds of people get transformed by the message of the good news. In fact, let's take a look at a couple of scriptures here. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for all are one in Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's look at another scripture. Colossians chapter 3 as well. Colossians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all, here we are, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Christ is all and is in all. And as you read down through this list of, of Paul's Facebook friends, you're going to find that that's true. <clears throat> you're going to find that that's true. You know why that's true? Because the gospel 
can go anywhere and touch anybody because it has no outward requirements. None. It doesn't mean you have to switch anything. It may give you other things to do, but it has no external requirements to be received. It doesn't say you have to do this and the gospel. It never says that. You have to do this and believe. It never says that. The gospel says what? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the only requirement. And the only requirement after that is what? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor. And love the world just as God loved the world. That's all the gospel requires. Oh, there are things that, you know, you, you might be doing that, you know, God says, don't do those anymore. There may be some things that you need to add to your life and say, yeah, here's what it is. But you know, the gospel goes everywhere, everywhere, to every place, from Camp Moro to Liberia to Japan to South America to Europe to Israel to Palestine to everywhere. The gospel can go anywhere because the gospel has no cultural changes necessary to receive it. No clothing restrictions. No food restrictions. That's why Paul said it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those are internal issues. And so the gospel can do it all. And the gospel is, is a gender-friendly, gender-friendly message. It's for everybody. You can see up here, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian. A barbarian can receive the gospel. A barbarian. Because the gospel changes a person from the inside out. It's the greatest message ever because it can go to the greatest amount of people ever. Nothing restricts it. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. And you see that here in the text over and over. That God transforms many different lives as you go on down this particular list. Let's look at a third thing that this gospel does on Paul's Facebook page here. Number three, God uses all kinds of friends to communicate the good news. He uses all kinds of different friends to communicate the good news. This is just loaded full of people who served with Paul and served Paul. But let's just look at three really quick. You notice that chapter 16 begins with the name Phoebe, with the name Phoebe. Let's take a look at what Paul says here about her. He says, I recommend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sancria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been great in helping people. Why does Paul point her out? Usually when a letter was given, the person was to receive the person who delivered the letter is the first one commended. Guess what? The person who appears to have delivered the, the letter to Romans, to the Romans, was a woman. Paul entrusted his letter to her. She appears to be a very wealthy entrepreneurial woman who had her own business and who seemed to move throughout the area and she seemed to have openings throughout the area. And so Paul gives her the letter and says, Take this letter to other places. Take it to the Romans. And uh, she seems to be one of those people who is ready to do whatever God asked her to do at any given moment. Let's take a look at another uh, couple of individuals. That's a single woman here that we see. We see Priscilla and Aquila. Their name might be very familiar with you. They're a husband and wife team who decided that they would join forces together and decided that they would deliver the message of the good news together. They did that in a number of ways. It seems as though they were at one time in Rome, and in about 49, Claudius kicked out all the Christians and the Jews out of Rome, or all the Jews, and they ended up going over to Corinth. And remember in the book of Acts who they met in Corinth? They met Paul in Corinth, and who else? Apollos. They met Apollos in Corinth. Remember, Apollos was a great preacher. But he didn't know the full message of the gospel. So Priscilla and Aquila in the book of Acts teach him so. They teach him the good news together. They sat there and in some ways mentored him and discipled him 
to be the great preacher that he was. Later on, you'll find that Priscilla and Aquila are also listed in Paul's letter in 2 Timothy, um, and they're living in uh, Ephesus. So uh, if you've sold your house more than once, you're in good company here, because they they appear to have been a couple that kind of moved around a little bit from Rome to Corinth, back to Rome, and then they relocated, it looks like, in Ephesus. So they seem to have been a couple that kind of moved around. They were They were highly mobile. And notice as well, they had a church in their home. So they opened up as a couple and had a church in their their home, a house church in their home. They were a very, very influential couple, Priscilla and Aquila. And you will also find here that um, there's a man named Erastus in verse 23. Take a look at him. It says, Erastus is the city's director of public works, and our brother, Quartus, sends you his greeting. Erastus. Seems to be a a man who had some kind of a position in the public sector of Rome. Maybe he drove around a chariot that said, Rome, the city that works. (laughs) I don't know if that's the case, but Erastus seems to have been part of the city center. He seems to have kept the things in the city moving forward. The gospel went out there. You see, what we see here is two key things. Number one, God uses people with different gifts. And God uses people in different places. God uses people with different gifts. And God uses people in different places. And you can see as Paul lists these, we've got people here of those two things. Different kinds of gifts. Priscilla and Aquila looked like they were a kind of mobile couple and they were very hospitable. Phoebe is one who's a businesswoman and uh, she has influence and so she uses that influence and her openings to spread the good news of the gospel. And Erastus, he's right up there in city government. And so he chooses to use that realm and his sphere of influence for that. So Paul lists his Facebook friends here, and we learn a lot from them. Let's look at another idea that comes right out of this particular section. Be sure to carefully consider each friend request. (laughs) Some of you get Facebook friend requests, right? I get them every single week. In fact, every single day, I get a Facebook friend request from somebody. Because, you know, when you have over 800 or so friends, they have how many friends, and they have how many friends. And you have to be very, very careful to check out those friend requests. You really do, before you confirm them. Well, there are some friends, Paul says, that you better not, you better not confirm. Let's take a look at where they are. Look at verses 17 through 19. 17 through 19. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord, but their own appetites. Smooth talking and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I'm uh, full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good, innocent, and about what is evil. Did you hear that? He said, you might get a friend request, and you better check it out. You better check it out. Because notice how he describes these particular friends. Notice what he says. They cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. They twist the scripture, or they sound good, but you say, something's not quite right there. And he says, listen, avoid these kinds of friend requests. When they come in and they want you to join them, or they have the answer, or they are the ones that have the secret to the Christian life, or they're the ones that, uh, that, that come across and say, you know, I found something brand new, and it's really, really new, and you've got to know it, and it's going to change everything. Just be very, very careful with that. In fact, take a look at this. Do you see the word, keep away from them? Keep away from them? Do you know what that word means in the original? Decline. <laughs> Decline. Just like Facebook, right? You get a Facebook request and it says decline. 
or don't confirm. That's exactly what that keep away phrase means. It means decline them. When you get a request from someone like that, decline it. Because Paul has worked through Romans chapter 1 all the way through Romans, you know, the book and said, here's the gospel. And if anything, you know, moves off of the gospel or challenges the message of the gospel, decline it. Decline it. Or if anyone wants you to join that kind of a group, decline it. In fact, the word keep away there is in the present, which means do it all the time, and it's a command. And Paul is saying, decline it. Don't confirm it. Don't confirm it. Well, let's look at one more thing. One more thing that we learned from from this Facebook page. And that is this. Be grateful that God, through Jesus Christ, has sent you a good news request to be his friend. Be grateful that God, through Jesus, sent you a friend request. Paul wraps this whole section up, the whole book of Romans, with these words. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God. Notice that. Notice that. Let's take a look just really quick at the request here. God has given us, and we should be so thankful for it. Notice what he says. He's established a gospel, and it is a revelation. It was something that was hidden. A revelation is a disclosure from God to man of something that was otherwise previously unknown about God's person, purpose, and works. That's what a revelation is. It's something that is previously sort of hidden. And Paul uses that word to say, here it is. And in some ways, it was a mystery. It was a mystery. Why was it a mystery? Because they were looking for something else. They, they couldn't figure out that this Jesus was really the Messiah. That was part of the mystery. Part of the mystery was that the Jews and the Gentiles would now become one people, as Ephesians 2 says. Part of the mystery was that we would be included In this marvelous seed of Abraham. That was part of the mystery. That God would love all people. That was part of the mystery. Part of the mystery was. Is that this Messiah would come. Not as a conqueror of Rome. But as Chris pointed out. He would come on a colt. You know it's very interesting. When Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. And people are putting their palms. And their jackets down. And they're saying you know. Hosanna in the highest blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It appeared so simple. It appeared so um, different. It was just something where you would think, this can't be the conqueror of Rome, but it would be the conqueror of all Romans' hearts. And that was the mystery. Because something bigger was going on when Jesus rode in than people could see. God was riding in, getting ready to go to the cross on Palm Sunday. That was a mystery. That was a mystery. And the book of Romans has cleared up that mystery. The book of Romans has said that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The book of Romans has said that there is no other way but Jesus. The book of Romans has simply said that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the message. That's it. Nothing more. That confession and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, it's all good. (laughs) It's all good because you have a relationship with God. You have a new relationship with the people around you. You see yourself in new and fresh ways. Things that you didn't understand suddenly open up to you and you become more alert. You understand what God is. Those existential questions start to find answers as Why is there something instead of nothing? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Is there an afterlife? Can a person really have a connection with God? All of that, all of those mysterious questions are answered in the good news. And if you've yet to come to Christ, if you've yet to to make a decision for Jesus, I want to encourage you to think about that. 
It's that simple. It's that simple. It's just saying, Jesus, I confess your Lord. I know my sin. I know my guilt. I bring that to you. I've missed the mark. I've shot myself in the foot. I've shot others in, in the foot. I've, I've made a mess of my life. But, but that doesn't matter because you know what? You can take the mess and if I confess with my mouth that you're Lord and give you my life, you will save me. You will save me. And so what I want to do is I want to close our series in the book of Romans here and I just bow your head and, and I want to invite you to do a couple of things. One, if you know the Lord and you've made that decision, then pray for someone you know who hasn't. And maybe pray for someone that, that God may want you to invite to Easter to hear the message of the good news on Resurrection Sunday next week. Whoever the Spirit of God brings to your mind. And if you're here and you have been wondering what does it take to have a relationship with God? What does it take to have a new story? What does it take to get out of this horrible situation I'm involved in? You know, Jesus says, come to me, O you who are weary and heavy laden. Maybe you've tried to connect with God through all kinds of religions, through all kinds of uh, practices, and it hasn't happened. He says, come to me. All you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And I want you to hear this. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That way is an easy way. It is not a burdensome way. Because it's wrapped up in me. And you'll find the greatest freedom ever by coming to me. So just invite him. Invite him to be your Lord. Confess right now in your mind and in your heart that he is Lord. And put your trust in him alone. Thank you, Father, for this message of good news. Thank you that the book of Romans, as rich in theology as it is, gives this very simple message. That Christ came. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose again. Christ will come again. And that if we believe that and we confess that, we're saved, plain and simple. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us this simple message. And thank you for revealing to us a mystery that people have wanted to have revealed to them for ages. The mystery of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the good news. Thank you for this series we've been in, Lord. May we live it out as we leave here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.